just starting out with a little icebreaker. What does the word disability mean to you? And what does the word independence mean to you? Stanley, I was best, just about to email you, but I don't have to now, so discard. That. And you could type, you could type it in the chat, or you could also um, speak it too. If you want to unmute yourself. I think independent to me is not that I can be free to do whatever I wish to do. Doesn't have to be big, but um, and disabled uh, disability means to me is anything that um, if you wish to do, but um, with some limitation either from other people or from you, uh, so then you are not able to do. I, Think that is some sort of disability, uh, disable, disability. Oh, very good. Right to me. And hi, Sally. We're just starting off with a little icebreaker for what does the word disability mean to you and what does the word independence mean to you? Um, you can either type it in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, you can speak to whichever way, whatever you feel comfortable with. We're going to keep this on for about three more minutes and then we'll get started on the presentation. And I am Vincent Lopez, the Assistive Technologies Manager at the Center for Independence of Individuals with Disabilities serving San Mateo County and uh, presenting am, with And I am Ben McMullen, the Systems, systems Change Advocate at Center for Independence of Individuals with Disabilities. Um, and my name is Alice. I am a librarian with San Mateo County Libraries. Um, and I'm just so thrilled to be working with CID. Do you say CID or CID? Or CID. CID. CID, OK. Yeah, I was making sure I've been saying it right the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I might as well do my opening spiel now while folks are looking at that icebreaker question. and um, We'll let folks trickle in. Um, so I'm just so excited to be working with CID, which stands for the Center for Independence of Individuals with Disabilities. Um, and it's in San Mateo County is where they're based. Um, they are, and apologies that I'm looking away. I have my notes on a second screen, so try to look at you and read notes. Um, they're a fantastic organization um, and they have lots of amazing resources for folks in the county and some resources for folks who also live further out. Um, and I'm sure they'll be sharing that as part of tonight's program. Um, a couple housekeeping things before we really get started. Um, I wanted to let you all know that this program is being recorded. Um, so if you speak, your audio will be included in um, in the recording, um, but because we're screen sharing, only the screen that's being shared and the video of the person currently speaking will be shown. So your names and your, if you have your video on and don't speak, none of that will be shown. Um, and we'll be posting that recording to the library's YouTube page. Um, if you need some Zoom assistance um, or if you have questions or, any of that, you're more than welcome to put them in the chat. Um, if you see a little speech bubble at the bottom of your screen, you can click on that and it will open up the chat. Um, if you want to turn on your video, you're more than welcome to do that. We love to see people's faces. Uh, but of course, if you're not comfortable turning on your video, that is totally fine. Um, there's a little video camera icon at the bottom left of your screen that you can use to turn on and off your video. Um, we also ask that folks stay muted during the presentation just to um, make sure that we can hear the presenters because with Zoom background noises can be disruptive. Um, and again, that button is in the bottom left. It's a little microphone button in the bottom left of your screen. Um, and we'll be monitoring the chat during the presentation. So um, anything you want to say or contribute, um, you're more than welcome to pop in there. And, and I'll turn it over to you two now because you're the real experts here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. 
And um, I'm seeing, uh, Benson, you might be better reading them out if we would like oh, to, but, but I'm seeing a, good, a lot of good responses in the chat, perspectives on what disability means to you and the word independence as well. Um, so a lot of good responses coming through for sure. It looks like Sally. Hi, Sally. Thank you for coming and visiting on this one again, too, and sharing your your evening with us. And uh, disability means some type of limitation. Independence means ability to access. And Dan Lee wrote, disability, an obstacle to functioning in ways that many others will take for granted. A very imperfect definition. Very good, Stanley, on there. Great, okay, let's get rolling. So this is our presentation for disability laws and activism. Um, visual description, a person holding a sign in front of, I'm gonna say the White House, but I'm wrong and Ben knows it. It's like <laughs> capital. <laughs> so I like I said it wrong every time. Uh, this was created by Benjamin McMullen and me, Vincent Lopez, the Center for Independence, San Mateo, and Kim Sacchio at the Education Access Center for Skyline College in San Bruno. Oop, we got somebody else in the chat. And Greta put, disability and experience deemed disadvantaged, independence, freedom to do what you want, when you want. Independence, living in a way where you are free to do what you want, and prepare to deal with the consequences. Very good. And just for clarification, that's the United States Capitol. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So welcome to our presentation. Tonight, we will try to fix uh, Basically, tonight we're talking about history, going back 50 years of history and advocacy into one hour. We will hit on five different sections or topics. The first one being key figures in disability advocacy. And two, we will highlight is Ed Roberts and Judy Heenan. Secondly, we'll talk about Section 504 in the Rehabilitation Act and how it led to the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Fourthly, we'll talk about the Olmstead decision and what that is and what it meant for people with disabilities living in the community. And lastly, we will wrap up with a discussion on where to go from here, what needs to be addressed, what are concerns as a collective group, and come up with some strategies for advocacy to take forward. Thanks, Lynn. What does, what is independent, what is the independent living movement? And according to Wikipedia, independent living as seen by its advocates, ad, advocates is a philosophy or a way of looking at society and disability in a worldwide movement of individuals with disabilities working for equal opportunity self-determination and self-respect. Next slide. Name two pioneers of the independent living movement. Does anybody have any two pioneers on there? Of course you, you guys... can. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I was just gonna say you can vocalize them or Put them in the chat. And the 
picture is of individuals with disabilities marching down a large street. I guess that sounds okay. Okay, well, we're gonna jump on this. Hey, two key, hey. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, two uh, key figures in the disability advocacy movement are Ed Roberts and Judy Hunan. And Ed Roberts is considered the father of independent living. Ed Roberts grew up in Burlingame, California. Uh, he went to high school in uh, Burlingame. I think he went, yeah, he went to high school in Burlingame. They wouldn't allow him to graduate high school because he did not take physical education. They did allow him to go to school through the phone, but they would not allow him to graduate because he couldn't take PE. With the help of his mother and himself, they went through and advocated so he can graduate high school. He ended up going to UC Berkeley. When Ed Roberts went to UC Berkeley, there was no such thing as ADA or accessibility. And if you've ever been to Berkeley, it's a very old place and they weren't considering disabilities when they built it, of course, when it was built. He created a support system and a network it within UC, UC Berkeley. Ed Roberts went through and he um, kind of did like a whole group thing. So if Ed Roberts, he ended up taking over the school infirmary, which is like the school hospital. And he had to be in a chamber, like a, a, like a lung, a, I forgot the name of it, but he had to be put into a chamber for so many hours a day um, for his body. He had, pol he, he had polio when he was growing up. And he, so they took over the school hospital. And then when he had to get to classes, he networked with other students. So he would be at the bottom of a stairwell. They would pick him up in his wheelchair, take him up to the, take him up the stairs so he can get to his classes. A lot of individuals with disabilities started catching on to this. And Ed Roberts created a whole support system and network for himself with other students with disabilities. And they were coined the rolling quads on there. From that, he took that as a template to co-found the first independent living center in, in the United States, which is in uh, Berkeley, which is the SIL, the Center for Independent Living. When he was going to college and he wanted to go to work and whatnot, the director of the DOR told him, you will never have a job like, like a, a job like anybody else. He ended up becoming the director of the Department of Rehab. And he also co-founded the World Institute on Disability. Um, Ed Roberts is considered the father of independent living. And he also grew up in the Bay Area. So it's really cool that we have somebody that did so much for the disability movement and helped create independent living centers, which give information and referral for people with disabilities to live on their own and be part of society. Uh, visual description of the picture picture of Ed Roberts in his power chair and somebody standing behind him with a sign that says civil rights for disabled. All right, so next up is Judy Hunan. She was an academic and an organizer. She was denied her teaching license due to her disability. She's sued the school board and became the first teacher to utilize a wheelchair. By the way, she was denied her teaching license because the school system considered her a fire hazard because they did not know how she would exit the school in, in the midst of a potential fire. She founded the disability, that's why she sued the school board. She founded Disability in Action in 1970. She became the deputy director of the first Center for Independent Living, which was the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley. And she was the deputy director there from 1975 1982. 
She was a co-organizer of the 503 sit-in. She co-founded the World Institute on Disability. She was an, uh, an advisor to the World Bank. And she also served in the Clinton and Obama, Obama administrations. And if you want to learn more about her, and if you have Netflix, they do have a movie called Crip Camp that talks about her, a group of people, and it kind of helped also with the independent living movement. Um, not for children, best for adults to watch ahead of time on there because it's very um, open and honest. So next up, next up is the Rehabilitation Act. And if anybody um, is familiar with the Rehabilitation Act, I want to share some information in the chat. Uh, feel free to do so. We'll also be speaking to it in the coming slides. On there. And a visual description of the picture is a person's legs on a scooter with an American flag and the stars are replaced by the accessible symbol. Because we can't, yeah. Okay. Oh, what was that then? Uh, just the universal, like symbol of accessibility. Way better description. Thank you. <laughs> the, the Rehabilitation Act was passed and signed into law on September 26, 1973. The Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act was the first disability civil rights law to be enacted in the United States. It required that any institution that receives federal funding should be fully accessible to people with disabilities. It set the stage for the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it works with the ADA in the IDEA to protect children and adults with disabilities from exclusion and discrimination in schools, jobs, and the community. And it helped change the way disabilities are viewed. Section 504, and it also follows our philosophy at CID is we're more into the independent living model instead of the medical model. The medical model is the problem is the disability. And under the independent living model, the problem is societal and environmental barriers. If you take away the societal and environmental barriers, everybody will be equal on the same front. The professionals know what's best. We prefer a self-directed, customer-driven approach um, of what the consumer wants or what the person wants on there for themselves so they have a voice. And the individual needs to be fixed. Our goal is a more independent and universally accessible environment. Um, for example, with sign language. If everybody knew sign language, it wouldn't be a problem really being deaf because everybody could speak the same language. I mean, even though you know there are other things, but on there, it's like, you know, kind of looking at it that way. If we had ramps everywhere, it would be accessible for everybody with wheelchairs. Um, you know, things like that. So this is the philosophy that Section 504 and the CID has as our philosophy also. So Section 504 was not implemented for four years. And we're going to get into why the takes so long. So President Nixon signed 504 into the law 
but the implementation was left up to the Health Education and Welfare Department, Hugh. Hugh was concerned with the cost of intimate implementation and kind of didn't do anything and put it on the Ford administration and came in after. By 1977, the funding and implement implementation was stalled on there. And of course, the little controller is right in the way of my notes. Okay, so by 1977, funding and implementation was stalled in Congress. So nothing was happening since it was signed. So here's a little timeline that we have on there. So it was signed in 1973, it got pushed off in 1974. It was still unsigned. No one with a disability was invited to represent their interests. And then the ACCD was formed, the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities. So they created their own group to go against us or to get it signed. Joseph Califano Jr. in 77, he refused to sign it. He said, we're not gonna do anything on there. On April 5th, 1977, the ACCD told them, if you don't sign this, something's gonna happen. Well, it turns out sit-ins and march-ins organized by the ACCD immediately launched across the nation in response to California, Califano's failure to sign Section 504. So this is a map of the Section 504 sit-in. We have Seattle, Washington, San Francisco, California, Denver, Colorado, Dallas, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, DC, Philadelphia, New York City, and Boston, Massachusetts. They all went into sit-ins in the Hugh offices. None of them lasted more than 24 hours except for San Francisco, which lasted almost a month on the sit-in that they did in San Francisco. So this is kind of, this is a little ad that they had on that. Oops. Oh man, I keep pressing buttons. I get way too well, happy when I press buttons. So Brad Lomax was a member of the Black Panther Party and Judy Hinnan knew him through CIL in which he was a member of the board, I do believe. So he got members of the Black Panthers to support people with disabilities in their protests. And it really accents the coalition and how you support coalitions in big uh, demonstrations of this nature. Next slide. And on oh, on the left is the uh, is the flyer for the demonstration at the Hugh office, and on the right is a picture of Brad Lomax um, uh, sitting in a wheelchair on there. So, oh, can I go back and talk a little bit more about this one, Ben? If you want to, yeah. yeah. So during the, during the protest, you have to think about it. Individuals with disabilities were, they locked themselves in the building for, for a long time. Um, they had, um, the veterans came to support them. They ended up shutting off a lot of things in the building to try and get people to leave. Uh, there was no communication. They shut off all the phones. It turns out the individuals who knew sign language were signing through the windows to each other to communicate. Jefferson Airplane showed up. Um, all the veterans showed up. Um, so a lot of people really supported this, uh, this movement on there. And it caused a lot of, you know, that them sitting there doing that protest was a huge thing that helped push the ADA go through, um, sorry, the Section 504 to go through. So our, our next slide is what does ADA mean to you? Feel free to put your comments in the chat and a visual description of the picture on the screen is Justin Dart and other disability um, advocates and activists taking part in a uh, protest march 
And above the marchers is a banner of a Martin Luther King Jr. quote that reads, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that also shows the, the link between the civil rights movement um, and the disability rights movement because um, ADA rights and disability rights are very much seen as a civil right as well. Next slide. So in 1990, after efforts of activists and advocates, George W. Bush, the first, or I'm sorry, President George Bush, the first, signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law in 1990. What it did was it expanded on protections under Section 504. It prohibits the discrimination, prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in all aspects of public life, not just federally funded institutions. This includes jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private spaces open to the general public. It also includes information technologies and telecoms, such as websites and things of that nature. It also guarantees equal opportunities in public accommodations, employment, transportation, and state and local organizations. Next slide. Visual description. We got George oh, yeah. C. Sorry. Ben, do you want to do it? Because I, I don't know who the other guy is. Sure. We have <laughs> we have uh, George Bush, President George Bush signing the ADA. Justin Dart is to his left. And I'm actually not sure who's to his right, another advocate. And there are two people behind uh, George, the president, looking over his shoulder. Okay, so key moments that led to the ADA. We obviously have Section 504, which we've spoke to. Uh, we have the gang of 19 Denver, Denver bus protest. We have the Civil Rights Res Restoration Act which was first introduced in 1984 and finally passed in 1988. It sought to overturn Grove City College versus Bell, a Supreme Court decision that had significant, significantly restricted the reach of the stat, statutes prohibiting statutes, excuse me, prohibiting race, ethnic origin, sex, or disability discrimination by recipients of federal funding. In March 6, 1988 to March 13, 1988, <laughs> we had the deaf president now protest at Gallaudet. And, and on Vincent, the do you want to speak to that? Yeah, on the Gang of 19 uh, Denver bus protest, it turns out that the buses were inaccessible for people with disabilities. And a group of individuals with disabilities decided to go in, in protest and lay in front of the buses so they can't go. 
So the picture that we have on the left front is individuals with disabilities laying in front of a bus um, to protest that they have inaccessible buses and no form of easy transportation on there. The deaf president now was Gallaudet College is a culturally deaf college and they never had a deaf president. They had three people running, two of them were hearing and one of them was deaf and the board of the college ended up, you know, all the students wanted a deaf president. Um, they tried to you know, go through and explain that we want a deaf president to represent us, we want one of us to represent us. And it turns out that the board wasn't hearing it, like literally. Uh, but the board ended up, the board was, they ended up getting, a, they ended up getting a person that was hearing to be their president. So the students got so upset that they ended up closing down the school and protesting. They even hotwired buses and blocked the entrance to the school. Um, it was a really big protest. Um, there's a lot of information on it. If you go on YouTube and punch in the deaf president now, or if you look at the documentary through deaf eyes, um, they cover that also. But it was a really powerful movement to show that individuals with disabilities have rights, can protest, and make their, even though they're deaf, they can make their voice heard on there. And that's what ended up, you know, like with protests like that and things pushing that helped with push the ADA to finally come to fruition. Right. Okay, so why is, so in the chat, if you care to, uh, here's a question is why is 1999 an important year for disability rights? And I don't want to give any hints, but it's kind of included in the picture here. Should we that do visual was, description? <laughs> uh, yeah, vis visual description. There are um, people standing and people in wheelchairs. And the backdrop is a tree. And there's a building behind the tree. But they're all holding, ultimately, the answer to the question. They're all holding the sign saying, I am Olmstead. And then the coming slides will get into the Olmstead decision that was passed in 1999. Next slide. So in 1999, there was a lawsuit filed in the state of Georgia that went up all the way to the United States Supreme Court. It was filed by two plaintiffs that wanted, that were, had been institutionalized for years and they wanted the right to receive care in the community rather than the institution. These plaintiffs were Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson. And finally, after appealing the um, case to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court found or decided in 1999 that requiring states they came down with the decision that requires states to stop segregating people with mental illness and to ensure that these people receive services in the most integrated and least restrictive setting appropriate to their needs. So ultimately they got they were eligible to receive care in the community rather than an institu the institution. And we still are trying, even though this Supreme Court decision was passed in 1999, we are still advocating uh, for adequate care in the community so people can stay in their homes and communities. Next slide. 
So when we put this together, these are two important key legislative initiatives we were we were advocating for. Since then, both had have been rolled up into the Build Back Better plan that the president has basically made the cornerstone legislation of his presidency to this point. The Disability with Integration Act was bipartisan legislation to address the fundamental issue that people who need long-term services and supports receive those services and supports in the community rather than being forced into institutions. And then Empower Care Act spoke to um, continuing the error money falls to the person, which basically means people are, can use Medicaid dollars to fund community living uh, rather than in the institutions. And it provides transitional money to pay for initial rent and necessary items to get established in the community. And this is something that independent living centers throughout the throughout the United States advocate for, and it's one of our core services that we help people transition out of institutions back to community living if they so choose. Next slide. So now our question for a little discussion is what changes We've, we've told you about a lot of disability history and how advocates have stood for things and advocated to where we are today. Question now is what changes would you like to see happen in the present and leading into the future? So feel free to share your thoughts in the chat and we'll get a discussion rolling here. You can unmute yourself too, if you'd like. Yep, absolutely. I know one issue that I've heard a lot about is um, marriage equality and the ability to get married without losing benefits. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of advocacy happening around that. Yeah, in fact, there's a bond to uh, the National Council on Independent Living, and they have a subcommittee that, in addition to other issues, that's one of the issues they are uh, advocating for, or, you know, so people can can get married and live that independent life. Um, there was a question actually that someone submitted when they registered for the program um, that I didn't see until right before we started, so I didn't have time to let you know. Um, and it was about advocacy in general. Um, it was what lessons have been learned to help activism be more self-sustaining over lifetime or lifetimes of people if you have any insight on sort of how the disability advocacy has been able to sustain itself and evolve. Yeah, I mean, from what, I, what I've experienced myself, it's, it's really kind of learning about, you know, what we're talking about now, learning about the people that came before, the pioneers, so to speak, and really having the uh, courage, you know, to step forth and be a part of the movement 
and realize that these rights are not going to be ours unless we stand up for them, you know, unless we ask the tough questions. So part of it is, I know it's, it's hard for, folk, for some folks that aren't used to it, but sometimes it's having to, having to get out of your comfort zone and challenge decision makers to be like, well, why, why is this, this system set up this way? You know, it doesn't, doesn't work exactly for, for me as a person with a disability and we need to address that. And just knowing that everybody has that voice um, and they, they have a right to, to explain where they're coming from and they have a right to challenge um, certain laws, certain regulations, if something doesn't apply to them, just ask the question why and if you have a belief that it should uh, respect people with disabilities more or, or whatever the, the uh, issue is, just uh, speak out about it, you know? What kind of opportunities, Ben, would be like for individuals with disabilities in San Mateo County, like um, different groups they could sit on or, you know, like, a, like you know, like I know you sit on, you sit in with a few different groups, like uh, with the PCC and stuff like that, so they can physically make a change, like even, even on you know, like a smaller local community scale. Yeah, so the PCC is the Paratransit Coordinating Council. And what Paratransit is, is it's a curb to curb service for those that need it. Uh, and it will you have to get through an eligibility process, but it's for people with disabilities who cannot use fixed route systems. And so what we do on the PCC is we advocate on behalf of the writers and consumers of PCC, of paratransit, excuse me, to ensure that system works the best for the, the customers and the consumers. Um, so that's one committee and council I'm on. I'm actually the chair. We're actually looking for members. So if that interests you, let me know and uh, we can get you to um, get you in touch with where you could potentially apply for it. I'm also involved with the Commission on Disabilities, which is a appointment by the Board of Supervisors. And they advise the Board of Supervisors on disability issues. There's many different committees, such as eight speaking directly to ADA. We have one covering legislative and advocacy, transportation, special events. So I'm leaving one or two out. Um, but an array, an array of systems affecting people with disabilities. And the other big committee I'm on is the VAC, which is the Voter Accessibility Advisory Committee. So that's also an appointed position. When we advise the voting office on accessibility and voting for people with disabilities. So we work with the the voting office to ensure that the voting process is as accessible um, as possible for people with disabilities. So those are just some of the committees I sit on. And then I'm also, lastly, and then I'll quit speaking to this, I'm on a national housing committee where we deal with uh, issues, uh, track legislation, 
talk about universal design and access and visibility and so forth. Ben is advocating and you can be an advocate too. No, oh, absolutely. <laughs> all, all the things I've, I've named, you can, you know, reach out to and uh, apply for. And Ben, I'll make sure to get a list of those organizations from you so that um, we can share that out after. Okay, that'd be great, that'd be great. And we, well, before COVID, we used to do the uh, Disability Capital Action Day where all the independent living centers got together and went to the Capitol in Sacramento. And, and we would march and then um, Ben would set up appointments um, with our local uh, representatives and go over issues and upcoming laws and help give a individual with a disability point of view and what our independent center, living center, um, you know, kind of wants out of these upcoming laws and things that are happening. And then we also have another conference at the national level, um, the Nickel Conference, Nickel, which I just alluded to being the National Council on Independent Living, where basically we go, we either, We've been doing it virtually throughout COVID, but typically we go to DC for a week. We have a conference where there's different workshops. You can learn about different aspects of advocacy in different areas. And also we have a Hill Day where we go visit with our federal legislature and address topics on the federal level, you know, that we either want to promote or advocate against on behalf of people with disabilities. And I got to join Ben uh, at the state level one, which was a lot of fun. And since I'm the assistive technologies person, I carry tools in my bag and you do not get through the metal detector with all your tools in your bag. <laughs> so I missed like two of the first meetings because of that. <laughs> they went through, like, what are all these things? And I go, they're tools, I'm, I fix stuff. So. Benson also uh, did co-presented a presentation, actually this presentation, we just shared it with y'all we presented that at the Nickel Conference virtually in, in DC. Does anybody have any questions, comments, discussion points? Because we fit that hour of information in 43 minutes, I think, which is really good. <laughs> um, I was and wondering, if nobody else has questions, and I want to leave space for that, uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving a quick overview of your um, various services that CID offers. Oh, yeah. We, oh, of course. I can't get to my other PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll start off with the with uh, kind of my wheelhouse, and then Ben, you want to jump in with the I guess maybe the rest. I don't know. I'll, I'll try and cover as much. As okay. <laughs> yep. We have sure. um, absolutely. How, we have a housing modification program, which is HAM, Housing Accessibility Modification Program, where we will, um, if you're a qualified, low income San Mateo County resident, low income means you make under a hundred thousand dollars a year, which is kind of scary, but it sounds like San Mateo County. Um, so if you're low income and you're, if you're renting, your landlord allows you to do modifications on the home. If you own the home, then you have to allow the modifications. Um, we can install ramps, grab bars, um, pretty much anything to make your house more accessible for you. Um, so you can stay in your house as long as possible and not go to an institution. We work with every different city in the county um, on funding 
So we have to go through every year and ask them for funding um, for, the, for the jobs on there. So that's our housing modification system. Um, I do assistive technology. We have a reuse program where people donate durable medical equipment to us. We turn around, clean it up, and either give it back out or you know, try and fundraise like for a tenth of the price of what it would be new. Um, and we cover everything from low tech to high tech. I'm the assistive technology manager. So any task, any disability, I have to find a way to make it happen with the use of assistive technology. And I always try and stay on the low tech to high tech. I like making stuff. So kind of is like a fun part of my job too. Uh, we have peer counseling. We also have a peer group that meets once a week. We have housing workshops to help you um, learn how to get yourself on the wait lists for low income housing and accessible housing for individuals with disabilities. Information and referral services, because we might not be the, you know, the expert on everything, but if not, we'll reach out to the expert. Um, I have a lot of times where I work with individuals with different disabilities. And if I'm not familiar with it or whatnot, I'll reach out to another nonprofit that specializes with that. We also have a group of, I think there's 28 independent living centers in California. Um, we have a network called the uh, Ability Tools Network, or we call it the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers for Individuals with Disabilities. And that's kind of our umbrella group. And they help us out with um, a program like if you want low cost internet access, um, they have a program for that. They have a, a voice options program um, that certain um, independent living centers do, but it's now it's kind of run by Department of Rehab. Anybody that is non-vocal has a right to a voice where they will give you an indefinite loan on an iPad loaded with speech programs so you can communicate with people in the community. Um, also, low-cost accessible phones, the California phone program. So we do have a lot of resources on that side. And I'm going to stop talking now because I know Ben knows of other services that we do also. Oh, sorry. One more, one more. Uh, WIPA, Work Incentive Planning Assistance. If you have a disability and you're on Medi-Cal or Medicaid and you want to go back to work and you don't want to lose your medical benefits, our work incentive planning assistance individuals, they'll go through and work with you to tell you how many hours you can work before you lose your benefits or getting fined. Also, there is a new program, I think, tied into that where you're now allowed to save money while you work for a certain pro, you know, like for a certain project you're trying to do or a certain goal, and they help work with you on that too. Okay, Ben, I think I'm done on that side. Yeah. Well, um... anything else? Benson actually covered most of our programs. Uh, so good job there. But also we have an ADA consulting and training program where I am actually an ADA trainer. I've gone through a train to training program where we can go out to speak to businesses, nonprofits, Anybody that has questions or wants consultations around the ADA, uh, from employment to um, public and private accommodations to telecom, any 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 section of the of the ADA, we can speak to. Um, so that is a service. We also have obviously systems change advocacy where we organize the community to take uh, to speak out for change of systems since it's transportation, housing, voting, uh, to make it more accessible for people with disabilities. And as we saw in the presentation, Judy Heenan and Ed Roberts were really pioneers of not just the independent living movement, but specifically systems change because in their time as advocates and Judy Heenan 
is still very much an advocate. There were a lot of systems that needed to be changed to work better for people with disabilities. Um, it definitely goes on for sure. And Vincent spoke to counseling and peer support, home modifications. Information and referral. So yeah, information and referral. So if somebody calls in, we can offer them information on what we do. If there's another organization or entity throughout the county that would better serve that person, individual need, we can refer them to that place in the county. We also have generalists that work now they're working in more specified areas. So that kind of got revamped, but they work with people with independent living skills. So people can develop their independent living skills uh, to the point where they're independent and they can do it fully on their own. We also have a quick match service, which falls under personal care attendant services. Every, that's a core service of independent living. Every independent, a core service, meaning every independent living center offers that. So basically what we do is somebody will call us, uh, and say, I need a personal care attendant. We have a registry of personal care attendants that we can share with them. They can go through the registry and pick out um, the individual they would like to work with um, to cover their personal care needs. Um, so we have that and covered systems change advocacy. We have transition, which is also a new, fairly new core service, but we've been doing it for quite some time. When we're talking about getting folks out of institutions who wish to do so, returning them to community living, that's the first or that's one prong of transition services. Another prong of transition services is working with individuals with disabilities in that step from say a high school setting to a post-secondary life, whether they want to pursue you know, a college degree uh, or whether they want to develop work skills, practical work skills that will get them out and in independent and working in the, the environment and to lead obviously to them becoming more productive and independent. So I think between uh, my fabulous colleague, Vincent and I, we have gone through the majority, if not all the services that we offer at CID. It's pretty amazing to me, the breadth of what you offer. So um, I do wanna respect folks' time. It's eight o'clock. Um, thank you everyone who came tonight. And thank you so much, Vincent and Ben.